Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Knowledge is Great lecture. Is the future of work online? My name is Leighton Erzberger, and I'm the Director of Education and English at the British Council East Asia. The, uh, the Knowledge is Great lecture was launched in 2015 by the British Council in Singapore. It showcases the UK's knowledge, creativity and innovation by inviting leading UK specialists to speak on areas of topical debate and discussion. If you have joined us on one of these lectures before, you will know that we will be running these lectures once a month for the rest of the year, typically on the last Thursday of each month, wherever possible. So do look out for our invitations to future lectures. We've so far covered this year three, uh, uh, three lectures on climate change. And obviously, as we get the chance to do it online, I think it's a very topical shift uh, uh, towards looking at the future of work being online. But before we begin today's session, could I please go over some housekeeping in, uh, information? Uh, we have more than 250 participants joining the session today. So please put your microphones on mute unless you wish to speak. Um, I'll pause here for a moment just to make sure that you can check your, uh, your mics. Please turn off your video cameras as well so that we can conserve bandwidth. A quick run through the program. First, I will invite Ms. Cara Owen, British High Commissioner to Singapore, to introduce our speaker for the evening, Dr. Fabian Stephanie. Dr. Stephanie will then deliver his lecture. If you have any questions that you would like to pose to Dr. Stephanie, you could type these into the chat box or indeed uh, raise your hand and I will ask you to unmute your, your microphone to ask your question. Dr. Stephanie will try to address as many of these as possible after his lecture. Uh, upon registration, many of you were also asked to submit questions, so we will be putting those into the chat um, and it would help me as moderator. If you could look at questions, if you see a question that, that reflects your own, put a like next to it and it will be more likely that I can ask that too. So feel free to like the questions that we collected before or to ask your own um, if, it's, if it's not there. We will aim to close the session right on time. Please take note that we are recording this session for the benefit of those who could not attend. Please also note on the accessibility of this session. Ms. Hannah Omar from the Singapore Association for the Deaf will be providing Singapore Sign Language interpretation during the lecture. Please pin Hannah's video to your screen if you would like to access the interpretation. You can do this by right clicking on the three dot icon next to Hannah's video. I'm just going to do that myself. Um, you could also choose to turn on closed captions. Uh, for this, uh, right click on the three dots at the top of your screen, right next to the chat icon. Scroll down and click on the CC icon. The captions will not be 100% accurate, but they could still be useful. So without further ado, let us begin. I'm very pleased to introduce you all to Her Excellency, Ms. Cara Owen. Ms. Owen has been the British High Commissioner to Singapore since 2019. Prior to this, she was Director for the Americas at the Foreign and Commonwealth Office and has served as the Deputy Head of Mission at the British Embassies in Paris and Hanoi. She has been awarded a CVO, Commander of the Victoria Order, and CMG, Champion of St. Michael and St. George, by Her Majesty the Queen for services to diplomacy. Ms. Owen graduated from the University of Sheffield with a BA in History, holds an MA from the London School of Economics and Diplomacy and International Strategy, and an MSc from Cranfield University in, the inter, uh, in International Human Resource Management. Alongside her diplomatic work, she has focused on diversity and inclusion and organizational development. The High Commissioner will provide this evening's opening address uh, and will then int in, um, introduce our speaker. Over to you, High Commissioner. Uh, thank you so much, Leighton, and thank you in advance to Hannah, who's going to be uh, keeping up with us and doing all of the sign language uh, through today's lecture. I'm really grateful to you for being with us. Um, so as Leighton just mentioned, uh, the British Council's Knowledge is Great lecture series presents an opportunity for academics, practitioners, students and the general interested public to engage in really stimulating discussions on a wide range of topics spanning arts, science, uh, the environment and more. 
Uh, when we were choosing who to invite, we thought really carefully about the kind of topics that were making up uh, big parts of our conversations between UK and Singapore, um, here in Singapore. And I think we've chosen really well. I was saying to uh, for Professor Fabian before he came on, uh, that I um, uh, the uh, lectures have been really stimulating so far uh, and really enjoyable and I have no doubt that this is going to be just uh, like that. In the first part of the series we focused on climate change and environmental sustainability. Um, that is part of our contribution to a steady drumbeat of activities in the run-up to COP26 which is hosted by the UK in Glasgow. And today we're moving on to a really topical area. I have been noticing over just even the last fortnight quite how many conversations um, I am having with senior um, colleagues uh, uh, of uh, all backgrounds about the future of work. Uh, and today we're going to be in particular be looking at online work. The gig economy, of course, is not something that is totally new. It wasn't something that we would have said when I was growing up and first coming into the workforce, but it's a phrase that we hear very frequently uh, now. Um, labour markets are in the middle of a really dramatic transformation. And we're not just talking about the increased adoption and acceptance of remote working fueled by the pandemic and what we refer fondly to as working from home. But in today's uncertain job market, the popularity of online labour platforms reflects a really monumental change that the internet and technology have had on the global economy. Uh, I think about my own career and uh, I'm quite shocked to say that I'm nearly 30 years uh, working for the same organisation, albeit in many different countries, but doing different versions of the same thing with the same employer. I absolutely do not believe that my children will have the same uh, career. I might and my parents might have looked at working with a, um, in a series of jobs or with a single employer or with a few employers, retiring at a lovely age, hopefully with a healthy nest egg uh, and then looking forward to a healthy and globally mobile uh, retirement. Um, I think that's just not going to be the same. It already isn't the same uh, for the younger generation and even for some people my age uh, already. The phenomenon of the gig economy has created a new class of workers who are flexible, adaptable, agile and highly mobile. And our demographic changes definitely in the UK and Singapore are going to require more of us to work uh, for longer. More and more companies are tilting towards online platforms to meet their capacity and capability needs. Um, on the one hand, increasing their access to specialised skills and on the other, providing themselves with the economic benefits of flexible on demand resources. Gig economy work has obviously been popular in Singapore for some years now, even before the pandemic, whether that's in the form of freelance work while seeking permanent employment or as a means of supplementing income while studying or engaging in entrepreneurial ventures or simply as a preference over a full time nine to five job. According to the Ministry of Manpower here in 2019, the number of freelancers or own account workers, as they're called here in Singapore, stood at about 211,000, which is about 10 percent of all employed residents. This figure had increased to 228,000 by mid 2020. The vast majority of these, 84 percent, were engaged in such work by choice, mostly because they enjoyed the flexibility and freedom associated with that type of working. According to a report published in the UK uh, Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, in 2018, 4.4% of the population in the UK worked in the gig economy in the 12 months preceding. The corresponding value in the wider population will probably lie between 3.2% and 6%. And the report cited that the estimated mean income from gig economy to be around 5,000, five and a half thousand pounds. These figures are likely to have changed significantly since that report was published and particularly so uh, as we have learned to adapt to the COVID-19 pandemic. Again, as in Singapore, independence and flexibility were the two aspects that those working in the gig economy were most satisfied with. There is also a relevant 2014 study by De Debbie Waskov, where she references the sharing economy, people sharing property, resources, time and skills across online platforms. Something that stood out for me in that was the fact that this has been particularly enabling for women. 
uh, who reviews the sharing economy as an opportunity to work flexibly and to become micro entrepreneurs, particularly possibly uh, fitting their work around other responsibilities. 44% of economic inactivity in women of working age in London was reported to be due to their caring responsibilities. The review also predicted that with around a third of sharing economy businesses having been founded or co-founded by women, the sector could have a real impact on why and how British women work in the future. I appreciate that most of this data refers to the overall gig economy including Grab and Uber drivers, for example, food delivery, and not just those working online. The questions that come into my mind are these. What skills are needed, particularly, to navigate this space of online gig work? Are there any skills gap, technological, social, others, that need to be addressed to support global remote working? What kind of impact will this have on organisations as a whole and on the experience of work our individuals? I say that partly because I'm an enormous extrovert who needs human company to be able to flourish the most. So I'm really delighted that we have Dr. Fabian Stefani from the University of Oxford, who's going to talk through some of his observations and his research in this area, and who will also be able to engage with all of you in response to your questions when he gets to the end of his lecture. Dr. Fabian is a researcher in social data science at the Oxford uh, Internet Institute um, and a research affiliate at the Humboldt Institute for Internet and Society in Berlin. At the OII, he works on the iLabor project, which studies the global dynamics of online labour markets in collaboration with the International Labour Organization. He has published um, research across domains applying social data science in fields of migration, innovation, labour economics and e-governance. He holds a PhD and degrees in economics and social sciences from different European institutions, including Universita Bocconi Milan and the um, University of Cambridge. As an economist and senior data scientist, he's also been working in the private sector and for various actors in the international policy landscape, such as uh, the UN Development Programme, the World Bank and the OECD in Paris. Dr. Stephanie, we really look forward to hearing from you and I'm delighted to hand over to you now. Thank you. Thank you very much for these uh, kind, work, uh, kind words, uh, Madam uh, High Commissioner, and, and let me seize this opportunity to also thank the, uh, the team of the British Council, Lissy, and also in particular Hannah that I see here uh, supporting this lecture in, in sign language. And let me, without further ado, um, switch to my presentation which you can hopefully see in full screen right now please tell me if this is, if this is not the case looks great thank you Dr. okay thank you so much so um the theme of this talk is um as as um madam high commissioner already pretty concisely introduced is about the future of work online and whether online labor markets these are platforms that i'll talk about in my um, lecture here, how they will change the way that we interact with um, each other and whether um, the work it might entirely shift um, online, which would be uh, also from my point of view, if I may say this, as I would um, classify myself as an extrovert, would be a pity. But I think um, I'll start with a slightly bigger picture. I started at the beginning and that these are uh, the two trends that are that are shaping um, labor markets right now. And these two trends are automation and remote work. Um, one of these trends, automation, has been with us and has been shaping labor markets um, for decades, if not for centuries. Um, so the idea behind this um, megatrend, you might even call it automation, is that human processes, that human tasks in, in labor flows are automated by machines. Um, these could be manual tasks as this picture illustrates here, done by um, robots in, in car production, for example. But increasingly over the last decades and with the advancement of, um, of computer power and the availability of, of large data sources, 
um, these machines become more and more hidden. And I'm talking about um, sophisticated algorithms and, and automated computer programs that are now um, more and more performing human cognitive tasks. So tasks that we do um, with our minds, with our, with our intellect and, and not so much with our hands, even though robots still play um, a big role in the, in the whole debate of, of automation of human labor. On the other hand, we have a fairly new, a fairly recent trend that um, had started with uh, the rise of the internet and was now even more pushed in the situation that I think we are all around the world um, very familiar with, and that is um, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, at least partly being forced to shift from on-site work, so going to uh, a, an office, so going to a company or firm every day, um, instead, we rather stay at home and work from home remotely with um, some slight complications as this, as this picture <clears throat> um, is, is telling us. And these two trends um, are often overlapping, as I will outline in the following, and they are really fundamentally changing the way that we interact um, on the labor market, that we interact in our jobs and how, how jobs and um, our jobs are performed and how also our firms are structured. Um, so th these are really incredible times, I may say this, um, and, and very fascinating times with tremendous changes on, on the labor market. Let me first um, talk about the second of these trends, remote work, though at later at the, in this talk, I will come back to, um, to the big um, economic driver of, of automation. So as I said, the trend of remote work, of digitalization, so of moving things that have happened in um, facilities, in businesses, in firms, in offices, online. We already knew this trend before the COVID-19 pandemic has hit our global economy. Um, but it's, I think it's fair to say that um, the pandemic and all the repercussions have accelerated this trend massively. And here are some numbers that I would like to introduce to you. Um, they have been gathered by the World Economic Forum in a report that has been conducted last year, where companies have been asked um, to what extent their workflows, the processes, how they organize their businesses, have been, organ have been um, impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. And interestingly, 83%, so a very large share of the companies reported that due to the repercussions of, of the COVID-19 pandemic to the lockdown and, and people having to work from home, that this really scaled, that they, this really accelerated their pace of remote work. I think a very prominent example of this is um, the company Twitter, the social media company Twitter, that had announced, I think, in summer, um, late summer last year, that, that it will um, shift processes in the long run um, entirely to a, to a remote working scenario. So where people could, the entire entire company would be decentralized and people would, would work from home. <clears throat> At the same time, we also see that half of these companies reported that, thinking about the other mega trend, that the COVID-19 pandemic and the lockdown had accelerated automation so that more and more processes um, were now performed by machines, for example, by smart, smart algorithms that I mentioned earlier. So what we see here is um, a global shift, and this is really a global uh, trend as this pandemic had unfolded globally of companies shifting towards remote work. And um, I can speak for myself, this has been a tremendous change for me, and I assume uh, for many of you it has been a tremendous change in the way that we that we work, that we interact. Um, for example, we, we are not able to um, meet that frequently physically with, with colleagues um, anymore. But for some people on the global labor market, this type of working remotely is business as usual. And I am talking about online freelancers. Who are online freelancers? Well, with the rise of the internet and with um, fast and stronger internet connections, um, a phenomenon called the so-called platform economy emerged. And this platform economy, this digital platform economy, um, is a place where platform mediate between sellers and buyers of certain things or certain tasks. So let me maybe start with an example of a platform that has been there for uh, a long, long time, uh, at least a, a decade from now, um, and that is Amazon, for example. So the, the originally Amazon was selling um, was selling books, 
And the internet made these platform companies like Amazon, for example, so powerful, or gave them such a big opportunity because it opened what it opened something that economists call a two-sided market. What is a two-sided market? Well, think of Amazon, for example. So Amazon began competing with um, bookstores around the world, first in the United States and later around the world. And a two-sided market or the books, the book market could be described as a two-sided market because on the one hand you have publishers trying to sell books and authors trying to sell books and on the other hand you have readers who would like to read books and um, there is a certain limitation to this two-sided market namely that it is difficult to put all the books that there are in the world in one shelf, in one uh, in one store, and um, even if you if you um, thought of the, the the biggest bookstores, the biggest Barnes and Noble, for example, bookstore that you could imagine, um, these bookstores were holding maybe thousands or tens of thousands of books, but there was a certain physical limitation. And at the same time, on the other hand, of on the other side of the market, there was also a limitation. Um, in terms of publishers, it, it wasn't possible to administer thousands or tens of thousands of authors and publishers. Though the internet changed this dramatically because in the digital bookshelves of Amazon, there was technically speaking at least endless space for books. And also on the other hand, it was with digital technologies much easier to talk to um, the, the other end of the market, to talk with publishers and, and authors, for example. And so. The digital technologies on these two-sided markets gave rise to very powerful platforms like Amazon's because in the Amazon bookstore now holding also various other items than books, but there was endless space. And um, that made it uh, a global company as well, a globally acting company. And a similar logic applies to the platforms that I'll be talking here, which are online freelance platforms or online gig work platforms. Because here we're not talking about books, but we're talking about jobs that are performed. We're talking about freelancers that are offering jobs to other individuals or other companies. Let me try to make an example. So imagine that you have um, uh, a new shop owner, a new entrepreneur in uh, London, for example, and she is very excited about having started her own company. And as companies usually do, she would like to have a logo for her new company, a brand logo. Though she doesn't know any kind of graphic design or, or person who is who's skilled in designing logos. Therefore, she could turn to one of these online freelance platforms and post a task. So saying, hey, I have a new company and I'm looking for a, a new brand franchise, a new logo. Is there anybody out there around the world, actually, who could help me with this? And then she would be as administered by the platform to a freelancer around the world, maybe a person, a young graphic designer from uh, Singapore, who's very skilled in designing logos and has expertise and reputation in designing logos for companies, they would exchange on the platform, they would negotiate a deal, and then in the end, um, a product would be, a logo design would be digitally delivered via this platform with the platform um, owning a share of this, of this transaction for them. This is the theory and um, these platforms, these online freelance platforms have been around for um, let's say maybe um, a, a decade or so um, and they are, they, are, they are growing. So like Amazon was, is, was started in the United States and is now, is now globally active, these platforms are also globally active. So they connect buyers and sellers of remote work, of work that can be performed digitally um, via the internet and in, in fact all sorts of work that can be delivered digitally can be found on these platforms. So um, the graphic design example is just one piece of the, of the puzzle. You could also find people that do translation work, translate between languages that uh, design fashion items that do the data entry, data um, analysis. And so over the years, this has become a very big, a very sizable and um, important market, though to a certain extent, with uh, every new um, economic phenomenon, you have um, the situation that things unfold, but it's at first difficult to measure them. But as you can imagine, um, policymakers and researchers got more and more interested in what is going on in these markets because these markets became economically, and so socially also, became more and more relevant and these platforms became more and more powerful. And this is why. Um, one of my colleagues, Professor Willy Ledonbürte at the OII, the University of Oxford, started a project called 
um, the iLabor project. And the iLabor project tried to address this problem that there is a new economic phenomenon, a new market, a new labor market, a global labor market, in fact, that had been, at least to the point where the project initiated, been mostly unmeasured. And therefore, the team around him created the so-called online labor index. And you will find more information on this online labor index on the iLabor page, which is shown here in the, in the header. But what the online labor index does is it precisely measures what is going on on these online um, gig platforms, on these online freelance platforms, and it's comparable to um, a, a stock market index, for example. And here on the left hand side, you see the online labor index. It starts in summer 2016, so it's turning five years old now. We're very happy about that, and we're hopefully also. Um, in the next couple of weeks are going to extend this index even further in collaboration with the International Labour Organization. But what you see here, I think, are several patterns. So first of all, you see a kind of a bumpy road, you know, this kind of up and down pattern. And this is actually for economists a typical pattern. So you see that um, at certain times of the year, mostly around the change of the year, the end of the year, um, you see a drop in the global demand for this online freelance work. Um, and this is what economists call seasonality. So typically, as people um, go home and go on holiday towards the end of the year, the demand for all sorts of work, and also including online work, drops. But what you see as well is an overall trend. And I think it's a pretty clear overall trend. In fact, over the last five years, on average every year, the online labor demand measured by our index has been growing by 10 to 11 percent. So this is a significant, significant growth if you would compare this, for example, to uh, the stock market development of a, of, a, of a company. So a significant um, upward pattern, more and more demand for online freelance work um, globally. And what you also see here, coming back to the COVID-19 pandemic, is a spike in early 2020. And this was really, um, as we interpreted this in the research paper, this was really due to the first um, lockdown, the first global lockdown, um, particularly um, influenced by the lockdown in the United States in, in April and, and May 2020, where we saw a surge in demand for online freelance work due to the fact that more and more companies had to close down and now people all people were working remotely and it was easier, at least that's what we are, you know, work was easier for remote workers, for freelance workers to compete now with an entirely, almost entirely remotely working um, labor force. What is also interesting about this index is that it allows us to have a look at the demand and supply of online freelance work across occupations and also across countries. And I um, posted a little example here <clears throat> where I compared um, Singapore with um, two um, other neighboring economies and two major European economies. And um, so what is shown here is the share of global demand for freelance work coming from a specific country. And I think what's really interesting here is even though Singapore in terms of per capita size so of, of, of headcount is a relatively small country compared to the other countries listed here, to the other economic powers here, but still it has the largest share, relatively speaking, to these other economies for online freelance work. So this is a phenomenon that we see um, on the internet is that sometimes the physical size, so in this case the physical headcount, the number of people living in the economy, do not necessarily relate anymore to economic measurements that we find online. So a relatively small country could still demand a relatively large share of freelance work, could utilize a relatively large share of freelance work. And this might be an opportunity, particularly for smaller countries that were initially in the on-site economy facing natural um, limitations. But talking about the global labor market, let's have a look how this market really looks globally. So this is, uh, I think, a very fascinating graphic that has been um, done in collaboration with a colleague at the SAI Business School for one of our upcoming um, publications. And it shows a sample of transactions, of freelance transactions, going on on one of the most popular online freelance platforms um, globally in 2020. So what do we see in this picture? 
you see little dots and they have different colors, blue and, and red. And these little dots are major cities around the world, hundreds of major cities around the world. And the different colors indicate whether um, people from these cities have been more engaged in buying online freelance work or whether they have been more engaged in selling online freelance work. So if the city is colored in red, then there are more sellers, there are more freelancers selling their work coming from the city. And if the city is colored in blue, then the city is on average demanding more, is buying more, more work. And the little lines connect the transactions. So for example, as I mentioned initially, you have a little line um, from London going to Singapore, and that's probably the transaction of the young entrepreneur buying um, the designing of a logo of a brand logo from a freelancer in, in Singapore. But what we see in this picture as well is a strong um, geography. So, and that's super fascinating because actually you could imagine that everybody that has, who has an internet connection and wants to participate on this market, and these markets are indeed um, growing in size as, we, as we've seen initially, you could imagine that everybody who has internet connections could and would actually participate on this market. But this is not the case. We see very fascinating, distinct geographies and to summarize just some of them, we see work flowing from countries like the Philippines and the Indian subcontinent, India, uh, Pakistan and Bangladesh, also um, Eastern Europe, flowing towards the coastal areas uh, on East and, and West in the United States and also to um, countries in, 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 uh, in Europe, so for example, the United Kingdom. What you also see, or actually do not see in this picture, is that there's very little participation in some regions of the world. So Sub-Saharan Africa, for example, is a region that is almost entirely um, not participating on this freelance market. And this is among many items of discussion among policymakers and researchers, this is something that needs to be clearly stated here. This market is global and it's also potentially growing, but it's strongly polarized. So there are, there are strong polarizations in terms of who is buying work and who is selling work, and some regions of the world, unfortunately, are not able to participate um, on this market yet. So coming back to the initial question of this talk, is the future of work online? Well, so and so. It's certainly the case that an online freelance market, more and more people over the last years have started to participate and are actually earning money with the projects, with the work that they are delivering. There are certain debates which are very relevant about how how, how well paid this money is um, in, in economic terms and economic discussion, discussion for social policy. Um, and there are also discussions on this strong polarization. So these markets are strongly polarized. So for some, the future of work or actually the present of work is already online. But let's come to the other mega trend that I mentioned initially, and that is automation. Automation is a major economic force and it's also a major economic fear across the centuries. So we could think back to the um, 18th century where um, I just read an example on this recently where weavers protested against an invention that was called the spinning frame, um, invented by Arkwright, um, a British entrepreneur, and they were protesting in, in Nottingham and they were destroying these machines, and that was in around uh, 1750, because they were scared that these machines would automate the work in the weaving industry, would automate the work away, and they would be jobless um, in the future. And these fears reoccur um, across decades and across centuries with every new technological advancement and every new possibility to use technologies, may they be physical technologies like machines and robots or invisible technologies like smart algorithms, but there's a reoccurring debate on this, on this topic. But what we also saw in the past is that a picture like this that we see right now where, where there's little space left for, for human work and machines are doing uh, the majority of the labor, that this picture is a bit too grim and a bit too unrealistic. Um, if we think about Arkwright's time, for example, and the, the spinning frame, it was very interesting to see that only 25 years after these protests in Nottingham, it was not that there was less human work going on and there were less weavers employed, but actually there was a staggering increase in the demand for human work because the economy started to grow. And, and most of this work 
was done then still by by humans this newly demanded work so i think it's a, it's a it's a bit too grim to think of machines um taking away entire occupations and making um making human work obsolete but we clearly see something else going on underneath and that is a changing pattern in the requirements in the tasks that people are performing um, there's a very, there has been a very nice investigation by the economists that I would like to show here, and where we precisely see how technologies change the way that work is done. Because if you think of the, the work that we do, there are different sorts of, of tasks and different types of tasks that we perform. Um, some people do a lot of their job with their hands and they do routine work, while other people, for example, they um, do a lot with them with their minds with by, by thinking and it's often not really a routine work it's a new task it's it's uh, new challenges that come every day and um, what we see what we've seen over the last um, let's say two to three decades is that as digital technologies enter the labor market there is more and more demand for non-routine cognitive work so for work that is new almost every day and that is often performed with uh, with with the mind or the brain rather with with the hands and but we see in, in occupations that are often determined by manual work as well like farming or nursing for example as i show here we also see digital technologies entering um, the labor market so we have two competing trends if i may summarize it like that so one is that certain routine tasks are now more and more automated by machines by smart algorithms for example and that at the same time we have to learn new skills to work together with digital technologies. But of course, this change is happening in a very, very short period of time, and this change can be very, very challenging. It is, in fact, very, very challenging to all of us, to the overall labor market, to workers, to firms, and also to policymakers and to education providers who are thinking about which skills do we actually need in the future. And I would like to make an example to further strengthen this point, um, alluding to the to the fascinating talks that I uh, enjoyed listening here in this uh, knowledge is great lecture format by the British Council. And many of these talks um, were focused on climate change. And I think that there is a comparison that could be made between automation, because be, between the process that I just described happening on the labor market and climate change. Because I think that both processes, um, in fact, are challenging us and are challenging challenging our habitats. So as automation, for example, challenges our occupational standards and the work that we do, and sometimes um, decreases the space for performing certain work that is now done by machine. Just like that, similar to that, climate change uh, threatens habitats. Think about penguins, for example, to use a very direct um, illustration. They are sitting on little ice floes, and these ice floes are shrinking by the minute because of effects of, of global warming. So just bear with me for a minute and think about work as being actually very similar to these penguins sitting on, uh, on, these, on these ice floes. And what we know from the labor market is there are certain occupations, indeed, due to processes of automation, that are shrinking in size. So where the space of um, self-fulfillment, of working, of performing work in these occupations becomes smaller and smaller due to this effect of global warming, if you want to call it like that, in, in automation, because more and more skills, more and more tasks are automated by machines. But we also know, on the other hand, that they are newly emerging occupations. So if you want to stick with this picture, big solid ice flows that are that are very thick and that are also very sustainable that will be there for years if not decades to come new occupations like for example um, data scientists so people working with huge amount of data and designing sophisticated algorithms and what we know from research is that often these two occupational domains are not that far apart from each other but the question is how do we make this possible how do we as these little penguins on this lake on the labor market make it possible to jump from shrinking occupations to more solid and more sustainable um, jobs well i think what people would need in this case is is a map so it's essentially knowing where you are on this map of ice flows 
and how small your ice flow might already have become and where to move if you're looking for more sustainable trips. But it's difficult to design such a map. And at this point, we argue that online labor markets might actually help us in this great challenge of reskilling en masse, of delivering you know, new reskilling ideas and new reskilling pathways to the labor market. And let me try to illustrate that. What we see, for example, here is um, a picture that we created using data from these online freelance markets. Because what's so fascinating on, about online labor markets and online freelance markets is that there are all sorts of jobs that are digitally delivered, but they are still done by human beings. So you could argue that a lot of these jobs that are performed online are sustainable jobs, that these jobs actually have a future and they, they might be even increasing in size in terms of um, the employment potential. And so we had a closer look at this data gathered from these online freelance platforms, and we tried to connect skills and occupations, and we tried to map occupations by the skills that they contain. And we realized that it is actually pretty similar to the penguins. Some of the smaller ice flows that might diminish or disappear entirely in the, in the future are sometimes pretty close to solid and big ice flows to newly emerging occupations where there is a sustainable future and that sometimes it just takes learning a couple of skills that we are able to hopefully identify in the future, a couple of skills to move away from small and shrinking ice flows, from small and shrinking occupations to more solid, more robust and more sustainable occupations. And let me please at this um, point summarize what I just said. So coming back to the initial question, is the future of work online? So in this, in this intersection of these two big trends of automation and remote work, will there be a future for work online? Well, we see on online labor platforms, there are indeed, these are, are indeed big marketplaces of online work, of remote work, and a sizable and a growing share of people do find work there. On the other hand, these marketplaces, <clears throat> they are global, but they are strongly polarized. So there are big debates going on about how well people are paid on these markets and if all people around the world can actually are able to participate on the market on these markets but at the same time the data from these online labor platforms from this online gig economy might be very valuable it might be valuable also for people who are not working online but are working on site because it might allow us to design sustainable reskilling advice in a time of technological disruption and help people learn valuable and new skills. If you want to find more um, on particularly this last aspect of the research, I'll invite you to scan the QR code up there for new commentary. And again, I thank you very much for your attention and looking forward to the discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you, Do uh, Dr. Stephanie. That was great, really insightful. Certainly given us a lot to think about. We had quite a few questions come in uh, while you were chatting. Uh, we've also been sharing some of the questions that came in before the session. Before I start asking the questions, just a reminder to everybody, please do uh, you know, go in and like the questions you would like to see asked uh, so I can make sure that I ask your questions first. Um, and of course, post any other additional questions that you have. Um, I think there's an interesting question. There's lots of interesting questions that came through, but just maybe to start with, the situation we're all in. Um, obviously, it, this is very immediate because of COVID-19 and the situation has put us in. Actually, there are some opportunities, the fact that you're able to join us from Oxford um, to, to, to speak with us here in Singapore. So that's also a benefit. But uh, there was a question from one of the people um, around, do you think this rising trend in online freelancer work would continue once COVID-19 situation is stabilized or resolved? I mean, nothing <clears throat> reverts back to the same, but do you think there'll be a dip? What do you think will happen? Yeah, that's that's actually that's actually a super interesting question, and um, I think only the future will will tell. But the thing is, I had a discussion recently with a colleague of mine who compared um, the situation with COVID nineteen to the financial crisis in in two thousand and eight, and and he was a bit uh, pessimistic about how much we we'll, we might learn from this from this from this crisis in terms of resilience, because he he made the analogy and said. Back then, when the economy went bust due to the um, subprime crisis, to the financial crisis in, in 2008, people said, oh, a lot of things have to change now. You know, we have to make financial markets more robust and we have to make sure we, systemically we have to make sure we have to change the system, make sure that things like this won't happen again. And he 
quite pessimistically, I wouldn't share this opinion entirely, said, well, and you see, things didn't really change a lot. You know, there's not a lot more banking regulation going on and so and such. And he argued that it, for, for COVID-19, it might be similar. So people said like, oh yeah, so we could we could now make use of this, you know, this situation um, that what people accommodated to work remotely and, and all these things. And he said like, but people won't. Be you know, companies, because there are also positive effects, clearly in terms of climate change, for example, you could imagine people don't have to, I mean, I wouldn't have to travel to Singapore with a, with a plane as much as I'd, I'd love to see colleagues there as well. Um, but I, I could deliver this speech here and then also, um, you know, um, take away pressure um, in terms of emissions um, um, on the, on the, on the, on the environment and but he he said that this will this will go back to normal you know we will, will be just like before covid and i think um i i disagree um with this argument because i think that covid-19 is also amplifying you know it's also pushing a trend that has already been there even before covid-19 we did see an increase uh, in a, a trend a rising trend in digitalization you know in breaking down um work, for example, in smaller pieces and selling it by the internet, like it's done on freelance markets, but also in in, in, in companies, for example, where we, even before COVID-19, some people already decided to stay at home. You know, we had discussions about uh, whether employers might have a legal right even, sorry, employees might even have a legal right to, to, to stay at home even before COVID-19. And this has now just been accelerated. So I think we might see a dip so, so some some companies, some firms will will certainly go back to a to kind of an old normal because they say that there needs to be, and I agree with that, there needs to be a certain level of human uh, inter interaction, not not just for extra words, but also I think like um, you know the, the subtle nuances and in, in, uh, in, in human communication, it's difficult to to bring them across entirely remotely. Um, and and it's just it's just healthy I think for humans to also have really physical interaction with other humans, but I think that uh, to a large extent COVID-19 will actually lead to a new normal with more remote working, for example. Yes. I'll ask a few more questions that dig into uh, sort of how it's changing, and then maybe I'll move on to a couple of questions about how we prepare, uh, just so you can sort of think about it that way. I think. A question I'll ask a little bit in ignorance, so you might need to explain the term, but one of the pre-questions, just because I'm curious to find out more, is around what spatial conditioning could be associated with online working. It sounds like a concept worth us understanding um, and what you think the impacts are. Um, well, I, I'm, I'm not entirely sure what spatial conditioning means in this context. So I was, I'm, I'm thinking when you say this, I'm thinking about how will people arrange their workplaces individually in, in the future, and and this is this is really a fascinating topic. So uh, there are colleagues of ours uh, at the um, Future of, um, of of Real Estate Initiative at Side Business School in Oxford. So they are looking exactly at these trends. So how will firms, how will companies, and also employees organize work if work has been, um, is been is going to be performed more and more remotely in the future. And there's an interesting trend where they study, um, I believe it was London actually, and where they realized that even before uh, COVID-19, but, but more so now in, in, in this situation, um, little local co-working spaces emerged. So previously you had a situation where a lot of um, co-working spaces, a phenomenon that was relatively new, um, existed in the, in the city. So actually, quite interestingly, right where the, the, the actual physical work had been before or it or was still happening, so you know, in the in the city of, of, of London. But now you realize that over the last two to three years, these co-working spaces became more decentralized and they accumulated at the little uh, subway stops in this whole sub the sub work, um, um, subway net network of um, underground network of London and um, became more decentralized and, and this might actually be a future pattern of um, of or what what it what was called spatial conditioning in the in this question so that people would still like to go to a place where they interact with others it might be a bit dull and it might also be um, a bit, bit limiting if you particularly think you have you live together with with your partner and with, and with kids at home they still might want to go to a place where they can work together sit together with others but it's not necessarily their, their company their firm it might be one of these decentralized co-working spaces from which they then deliver work to a company that sits 
maybe in a different part of town and maybe is maybe even also in a, in a in a different country i mean if you think of twitter for example that i think they quite convincingly announced that they will really decentralize and really make their company fully remotely as far as i understood for people who want to do this that there is a, i think a large share of people who want to do this i think a question from uh, uh you know one of the people who have joined us today that relates to that um is how you think online working would reform business leadership and I think you could look at that two ways, right? One of for those of us who might be in that position of leadership, but also those of us entering the workshop uh, workforce, what might we expect from leadership in the future as well in this new online world? Yeah, well, that's a that's a, that's a difficult question, actually. I mean, I'm, I'm not I'm not too familiar with managerial practices, but my guess would be that um, so leadership is um, so one should be aware not to have a, an overly technical perception of human interaction. So it's, it, it, it is the case that, for example, on online freelance markets, these markets work well because they leverage on the effect that human work can be, to a certain extent, be broken down into smaller uh, subunits. So let me try to make one quick example, and then I come back to the question is, mm. for example, what you see is, what you could imagine is somebody wants to um, wants to do a, a commercial um, spot for, for, a, for a product, an advertisement, and while before the times of this fragmentation, this outsourcing by online freelance platforms, you had to hire um, essentially a, a big team of, 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 of experts, and that was potentially pretty costly. So people that do the, the set and the, and the design and the, the music for the, for the advertisement and things like that. And now in these freelance markets, the, the bits and pieces that you need to make an advertisement, a video advertisement, can be broken down and you get individual freelancers at more uh, more economically often to do the individual bits and pieces, you know, to do the, do the music, do the background, do the, uh, you know, um, maybe you want to do it with the subtitles in a different language. Uh, what I'm saying is this is this is technically possible to a certain extent, but when it comes to leadership, there is there is more than can be than it can be broken down to 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 small fragments of uh, bits of pieces of work. It's also about inspiring people, and I would say. It's difficult, or it's it's a it's much more cumbersome to inspire people um, through a, a webcam and through a computer than rather standing in front of a team mm. or talking to somebody directly, or maybe doing something together, doing an activity together, doing a sports event together. You know these typical team building um, measures that companies often have, and I think this will, as we're all humans and we all re we all you know. We all rely on these on these direct connections and bonds. This will always be a part of of leadership, and that will always be carried out physically. Yeah, I think I think that's a really good point. I'll I'll squeeze in two more questions if if that's okay. Uh, and to do that, I'll combine a couple of the questions in the chat that sort of relate to well-being, uh, safeguarding. Um, you know, sort of repercussions on mental health and so on. Just, mm -hmm. you know, what reflections you might have, because, you know, you had that point around leadership and inspiring and just maybe a couple of reflections on what you think the impact of that will be. And then I'll end with one more question. Yeah, well, uh, un unfortunately, the topic of um, of of, of uh, um, mental illnesses and of, of depression and, and um, you know, and, and, and psychological burdens ha has been there before before remote work existed and also before the internet existed. But I think, even though this is not my area of expertise, I do think that there is, at least in the UK, with the initiative of starting a ministry of loneliness, I think even, mm. there is there is a trend, unfortunately, um, kind of a downside of this technological development that people, certain group of people um, feel to be more isolated. And this is, and this is a worrying trend, I think. Um, and, um, I think it's it's important to say that that the, the technology is not you know the, the internet like or removing or the internet is is just a technology in the sense that um, you know it's not intrinsically good or bad it's 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 it is what it is and it's the way that we that we use it and how we de how we decide to 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 design this um, and and unfortunately if we do not pay a lot of attention to to design it well to design it around humans and around the well being of humans. Then it might, unfortunately, facilitate strengths that already existed before, and that is people feeling more isolated, feeling more lonely, feeling more more depressed. And so I think that the idea, for example, that I that I mentioned initially, 
when it comes to leveraging the, the cost saving effects for, for companies and also then in the, in the end, hopefully for, for employers, um, uh, for employees, by decentralizing this work, but by still keeping people together in co-working spaces and decentralized co-working spaces, this might certainly be an option where you can leverage the economic benefits, but at the same time limit, you know, the potential downsides that these technologies have that I just mentioned. That makes sense. So I'll ask the prep question. Um, and this was the first question that came in actually when you started. So I think it's quite interesting in that sense. But uh, as a representative of, uh, uh, you know, one of the top universities in the UK, how would you say British universities are preparing students for the digital age? Oh, wow. Um, this is, that's a, that's a question I did not expect. Um, well, the thing is, so I can speak maybe a little bit from my own experience and the, and the experience that I, that I shared in discussions with, with, with colleagues. So, of course, I, I also um, supervise students. I have, a, I have a bunch of fascinating students, master's students this year. And from the beginning, our interaction has been entirely digital, and this is something I have never done before. So it, it, they are they are they are all great students, but we unfortunately never had the chance to meet um, to meet to meet physically in the in the in the meantime. Um, I would I would hope that this that this is still going to change, and that we might have have the the opportunity towards the end of the of the academic year then uh, still have have an exchange. Um, what I realized is that. Um, so th there are two things. So one is that, that 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 this generation is quite naturally, if you compare it to the the, the overall labor market, and because I talked about the, the labor market in general, is of course um, digital native. You know, um, my, my students are I think around 20, 25 years old. So they they they've been growing up with the internet and with digital technologies, um, but at the same time. If knowing how to knowing how um, uh, how to work casually uh, with the technology and how technology works doesn't necessarily mean that you um, that you're able to use it well for the purpose of, um, of of studying. So, and I think this is something this is something that has to be taught at very very early age how to acquire information. You know how to how to use this this ocean of of information of data to to. To, to make use of this for your for your purposes and also to you know avoid um, dead ends of maybe you know um, uh, retrieving fake news or working with with fake news with false information and I think this is this is really this is really a literacy so this is this is really something that needs to be taught right after teaching kids how to read and how to and how to write and how to, how to how to calculate but i have to say maybe as a side note for my students i saw a very positive effect because they were very very good and I heard this also from colleague, colleagues in doing the readings so apparently the, they've been reading much more than they've been doing much more of the of the paperwork and also of the um, voluntary paperwork and the voluntary readings than before but that is probably due to uh, the absence of you know entertaining That's other true. entertaining opportunities <laughs> <laughs> well and 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 obviously at its core is learning how to learn right so yeah uh, you know learning from the next generation there's a lot that we can learn too um and that you know whatever we learn at university we're gonna have to relearn throughout work as i'm discovering so Absolutely. thank you very much dr fabian thank you for your time today thank you everybody for your questions um so unfortunately, this is all that we have time for. But on behalf of the British Council, uh, you know, do let me thank you one more time, Dr. Stephanie, for the thought provoking uh, uh, insights that you shared with us today. Um, we'll share your contact details, of course, uh, you know, yes. and the QR yes, code will make sure that that's accessible um, and a recording of this will be posted online for people who would like to revisit it. I'd also like to thank the uh, uh, the High Commissioner uh, for her introduction today and also the Singapore Association for the Deaf and Ms. Hanna for supporting us with sign language interpretation during the session. Uh, once we post uh, uh, the recording of the session, please feel free to share this with your friends and colleagues who are unable to, uh, uh, to join us today. Uh, thank you all for being part of this lecture. Do remember that we will continue to run these lectures once a month uh, for the rest of the year. The next session will be on the 27th of May at 5 p.m. Singapore time. Uh, Professor Benjamin Sovacol from the University of Sussex will talk to us about technical, social, political, and economic dimensions of energy mega projects as, as part of the efforts to improve energy security. 
have a good evening, everyone. Thanks again, um, and I look forward to seeing you next month. Thank you so much. Have sure. a great afternoon.